My life goal is to live a life of love. We talk in this church about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing the things that Jesus did. But here's the problem. It is not at all natural to me to prefer others over my own life. At night, particularly now in winter, when Richard rolls over and takes all the blankets with him, it is not my default response to leave him with the blankets and either snuggle closer or go and get another blanket so that he doesn't wake up. I try to, but it has to go against what is natural to me. And in the morning, there seems to be early morning sport for a different child of ours throughout the week. When the alarm goes off, I pretend I'm asleep <laughs> so that I don't have to be the one that gets up. I haven't even got out of bed in the morning before I've failed at my life goal. It is not easy to live a life of love, and yet following Jesus is going to require that of us. That is who Jesus was. Jesus said of himself, nobody has greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he calls us to follow him into a life of love. There is hope, though. This Beatitude series has been all about the fact that with the right teacher and the right curriculum, it is astounding what humans can learn. Just look, open your kid's maths book, and you'll see that the same child that can't remember to take his bowl out in the morning is the same child that can do quadratic algebraic equations with the right teacher and the right curriculum. When our girls were young, we wanted them to learn ballet, but not with anybody. We wanted them to learn ballet with Louise because of who she was, how she looked, how she carried herself, what ballet made her. We wanted ballet, but we wanted it with Louise. And that's what our girls learn. They learn to talk like her, to stand like her, to walk like her, to carry themselves like her by being in her classes, the right teacher, the right curriculum. We've spoken about the Beatitudes as it's kind of eight proverb-like phrases. They're short, but they're full of instruction. They're, they're deep. They're, they're layered, multi-layered, and there's eight of them. We're on the eighth one today, and these are Jesus was the one who, who spoke them, and they kind of were the headlines that he then went in to, to teach through his curriculum. And we're on the eighth one this morning, and the eighth one... The eighth one, after that, there's a ninth one that kind of reiterates the eighth one and summarizes all of them. So I'm going to just read number eight to you first. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed. When we preach, we try to set a destination and then encourage you all through the, the vision of this destination to come with me for the next 30 minutes so that I can lead you somewhere. It is my unenviable privilege to convince you that if you follow me for the next 30 minutes, I will lead you into thinking that when people insult you and persecute you and mistreat you for righteousness, when you're just doing good, it is a blessing. Not an easy, this is, this is PhD level <laughs> discipleship, what we're talking about here. This is, this is, lay my life down, follow Jesus to the cross, kind of a discipleship. But this is how Jesus opened it. So perhaps he will do a better job than I will. And so I'm going to go straight to the scriptures and we're going to put ourselves into the situation where Jesus actually said this for the first time. And as we've said a number of times in the last few weeks, he didn't stand up like I'm doing and speak to a bigger crowd. This is, this is a good posture when you want to reach a lot of people. He actually withdrew, he went up a mountainside and he sat down. Whenever I'm sitting down, I, it's the posture when I really want the people that I'm talking to to listen to me. I want it to be for those who are close, those who are pressing in. I'm sitting down so that you have to come further forward. And it's that posture that Jesus takes as he begins to teach on these Beatitudes that opens up his sermon. So I've, I'm going to put them on the board just in summary so that you can follow along a little bit, but it's not word for word from the scripture. It starts off the first one we did. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus introduces right in the beginning that if you think you've got to do it all, that it's all up to you, you're going to fail before you start. To start on this journey, you need to acknowledge, I actually need a savior. I need someone to help me. I, I can't do this all on my own by trying hard enough. I actually need to open up my hands and take a posture of trust in the Savior, admit that I'm, I'm poor in spirit, and lean into that as a place that I can receive blessing. Then he moves on, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Again, counterintuitive. I want to turn away from pain. I, I want to ignore it. I want to press it aside. I don't want to focus on it. And Jesus calls us, turn into pain, confront it, talk about it, understand it including the pain of your own sin and brokenness, and blessed are those who mourn. Come through this into comfort. Thirdly, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Speaking to a society that, like today, it was the powerful, the strong, those who used their strength for their own good that had land. And he says, no, that's not rightful possession. Rightful possession is inheritance. Strength, absolutely, but wrapped in humility, allowing your hands to be open to receive from God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied, they will be filled. It is no longer a position where we just, there's nothing I can do about it, a learned helplessness. He said, no, wake up to the hunger in you for what is right, for seeing, for seeing good accomplished again. Wake up to that, he says to the people that are sitting around him. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He says, stop measuring and comparing. I'm better than, than that person. I, I'm judging them. No, I need mercy. So look with eyes of mercy on somebody else. Forgive. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. It's only when we are authentically ourselves, when we stop pretending to be somebody, when we stop with all the masks and putting on this persona that we like to do, we actually just become our true, real selves. Strength wrapped in humility, humble, dealing with our real emotions, knowing that we need God's help. It is through that position of being pure in heart, being wholeheartedly ourselves, that we'll actually be able to see God, Jesus is saying to those closest to him, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. We're not talking about people who are weak and oppressed here. We're talking about people with agency, people with strength, wrapped in humility, who understand that it's not theirs to say us versus them, but theirs to lean around, encompass others, include others in this journey into the kingdom. And then he comes with the eighth one. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for doing the right thing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's so interesting that this one that I'm intimidated to teach because it's PhD level, you get the same reward as you do right in the beginning. It links them together, number one and number eight. If you just start with open-handed trust, Jesus, I need a savior. I need you to help me. And Yours is already the kingdom of heaven. If, if you've come in here and this is your very first day and all you can say is, I need help. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. And if you've been pushing in to learn and to grow into being with Jesus and becoming like Jesus, and depending on how quickly you learn, years later or decades later, you're ready to lay your life down. Great. Yours is also the kingdom of heaven. That is then reiterated in the ninth one. So if we look at verse 10 to 12, the end of the Beatitudes, it starts with blessed are those who are persecuted. Number eight, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And up until now, all of them has been about hypothetical situations. If you were meek, this. Blessed are the meek, the peacemakers, those who are. And all of a sudden, he turns the attention to the people who are still listening to him. And he says to them, blessed are you when it's something that's going to happen to them because they're still listening. They're still sitting in the room. They're still gathered at his feet. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely 
say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they've persecuted all the prophets who've come before you. What exactly did Jesus want us to do? Are we supposed to honestly, when somebody mistreats us, be glad about it? Oh, good. I'm so glad that person mistreated. I'm so glad they cut me off in the traffic. Oh, they said, what about me? Oh, praise Jesus. Very good. I'm so glad. It's not an easy place to land. Uh, it's not an easy way to live life. And so we're going to break it down. by Throughout all of these, we've looked at a change from what is natural to us. It's natural to be power hungry to meekness, wrapping, it, wrapping our strength in humility. What is the change of posture? Close-handed to open-handed. In this one, naturally, what do we do when we are persecuted, when we are mistreated in general, not even for doing good, just when somebody mistreats us, what is our natural response? And then we'll look at for righteousness sake. So there was a mystery in our house and neighborhood for quite a while. It was the mystery of rubbish day. We don't want to have rubbish and strewn on our, on our verge after the rubbish is gone. And sometimes if you put out black bags, um, people, animals can get into them and there can be rubbish all over your verge. And so we invested in one of those big green bins. The mystery was this. We would put out our green bin on a Monday morning, and when we came home from work on a Monday evening, there was rubbish on our verge as if somebody had been going through black bags. It was confusing. So we set out an expedition, a, rep, a recce. We set children to spy on the land. And this is what they discovered, that one of our neighbors was bringing his rubbish bags in the morning across the road, not just putting it across the road and putting them next to our green bin. And it was those rubbish bags that were getting broken and causing mess on our verge. So we had a family meeting and obviously the right thing to do was to put the rubbish back on his verge every morning. The trouble is he's quite a scary guy. So the next natural thing is, well, at the very least, we can move it to the next or neighbor's verge. <laughs> but we're not going to keep the rubbish on our verge, surely. Our natural response to being mistreated is to give it back, or at least give it sideways. <laughs> Retaliate comes from the word re, means again, and tell us is the same. I'll give you back the same. <laughs> I will retaliate. I'm going to give you back what I've received, or at least give somebody what I've received. What I'm not going to do is keep the rubbish that you've dumped into my life or onto my verge. This becomes a never-ending cycle. There is a fable about an angry boss who would often shout at his employees, and the one day he shouted at a man working for him. And this man went home upset, and as he walked through the front door, tripped over one of his kids' school bags and looked up at his wife and yelled at her for not having the house tidy by the time he got home. She was so upset, she went off into the bathroom to be alone for a few minutes, and her daughter, realizing she was upset, followed her to the bathroom, knocked on the door and called, Mom, and she said, Oh my goodness, can you just leave me alone for one minute? The daughter was so upset and went running outside, saw her brother playing with a ball and kicked his ball right over the wall. The brother didn't know what to do, but the next day he was still upset, and so he took one of his friend's school bags and emptied it out. He was angry. That friend went home, walked through the door, so upset at what had happened at school, and kicked his dog. The dog ran out the gate and bit a cyclist going past, and the cyclist happened to be the angry boss. <laughs> From the beginning of the cycle. Pain and evil will be transferred. It will either be given straight back if we have the agency to do that. Maybe if we're big and strong and we're able to fight back immediately, great. Put the rubbish back on his own verge. Or we're scared of doing that, but it still needs to be processed and we 
we go sideways. Sometimes it's not even hurting the people next to us, but it's going sideways with gossip. Can you believe what they did? And through that, we can destroy communities, families, hundreds of families and communities have been torn apart because of people going sideways with their pain. Our natural response, if we're talking about those changes of, uh, of position, our natural response is to react defensively. And Jesus is calling us, blessed are those who are perse- persecuted, to end the cycle. We have to break the cycle. What if is the question for break the cycle, that action point What if we could learn to process pain without transmitting it to others? What if we could learn to process pain without transmitting it to others? What would that be like? Can we find a new way to respond to being treated unfairly? Jesus (laughs) holds us to a very high standard on this account. First of all, he modeled an unbelievably high standard, a radically radical alternative. When the religious leaders attacked him with his reputation, he answered calmly. When he was betrayed by his closest friend and turned over to the authorities, he surrendered to his arrest. And when he was falsely accused and put on trial, which ended up in his death, he did not defend himself, but remained silent. But he asks us to have the same standard if we're following him as well. In Matthew 5, the same sermon that we've been talking about further along after the Beatitudes, Jesus teaches this from verse 38. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, retell us, retaliate, give back what you got. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He's talking to a people who are under Roman oppression. That mile, you probably, if you've been in church for a while, have heard teaching into that context, but you may not have. It was a rule in those days that if a Roman soldier said to you, you have to carry my bag, they put a limit on the Roman soldiers. They may only ask a stranger to carry their their bags and their, their weapons for one mile, and then they could ask somebody else to support the army. Jesus is saying, if somebody's forcing you to do that, to stop your life and carry their things for one mile, offer offer for two. Give more than what is required, what is mandated by you. You see, here's the crazy thing. Jesus did not have his life taken from him. He gave it away. He laid it down. You couldn't give the first mile but you can give the second. Jesus is not talking about accepting abuse and other people's rubbish from a place of weakness and helplessness and there's nothing that I can do about it. This is at the end of the Beatitudes. If you look at the meekness, number three, you cannot be meek and weak at the same time. Meekness and weakness cannot coexist because meekness is a choice to wrap your strength in humility. Jesus exhibited, showed us the definition of meekness when he laid down his throne in heaven and came to earth. It was a choice to not act in his strength for his own benefit, but to lay it down. He's calling us to find a position of strength. He's calling us, yes, if you're being, if you're being hurt, mourn, seek justice, But only when you've got strength in meekness, only when you are able to give others mercy from that position, we can accept being mistreated for the sake of what is good. A non 
violent response is what he's calling us to. And it's a non-violent resistance to evil because you are not repaying evil with evil. You are resisting evil by breaking the cycle. We are living in a world of toxic evil where hurt and pain is being passed from one to another, round and round, this toxic cycle. Jesus is saying, I have brought a way to break the cycle so that fresh water can, can flow in and fresh water can flow out. How? By the love of God flows into our life. We have a source, a source of goodness and love constantly flowing into us so that the, the outlet is forgiveness and kindness and goodness flowing to others. When somebody puts their rubbish on my verge, I can go and buy another green bin and put it here and say to my neighbor, friend, would you like to put your rubbish in this green bin or perhaps even keep it at your house, the green bin? I can buy that for you. I have a way of getting rid of the rubbish. It doesn't just have to go from verge to verge and end up spilt here. I have an outlet for the rubbish in this world. Jesus came to break the cycle of evil, all the evil that he took upon himself on the cross to death, and then came out the other side to say the cycle is broken. Live in the broken cycle. Mistreatment has a different response to Christians from Christians. But specifically, we're talking about being persecuted for righteousness, not just mistreated in general. That has a response that we've now discussed. But actually, this beatitude is saying, when you are mistreated, persecuted for righteousness, keep doing good. Our second action point, we first break the cycle. Secondly, we keep doing good. I think... This persecuted idea, sometimes Christians have jumped on the bandwagon and they've said, you know, everybody is being mean to me. Everybody's shouting at me. Obviously, I'm, it's because I'm a Christian. I'm being persecuted for righteousness. But the truth is possibly it's because you never asked for advice and you're doing something really stupid. It's possible. It's possible. We're supposed to work this out in community with godly advice, living our lives, doing good. We're looking to celebrate and rejoice when we're persecuted for doing good, not for doing stupid. Sometimes your boss or your teacher is just angry and grumpy and you're just being persecuted. But it's, yes, our response needs to be different from others, but it's not for righteousness. So what is this? What well, what is for righteousness? When can it be for that? I think when we hear about this, sometimes as Christians living in South Africa, we have a lot of religious freedom in this country. We might think that is amazing, and we are so proud of the people that we either don't know by name, Christians in other countries where they are persecuted, or maybe you even do, and you say, "No, it is unbelievable." I, I know we know we have friends that have been imprisoned and that have lost their livelihoods. It, it is unbelievable. Living in this country, what does it look like to be persecuted for righteousness? Is there such a thing? And I would argue that there is. We are living in a day where very often, first of all, the, the power structures that be are not set up for righteousness. They're set up to benefit those who are in power. So if we are never being persecuted, it could be that we are on the side of power, <laughs> or we're not standing up for those that we should be standing up for. We need to be looking at how we make decisions. How do I choose when I talk and when I keep quiet? How do I choose when I act and when I step back? Is my decision to avoid ridicule, to fit in, to avoid persecution, or is my decision what is right in this situation? And that can be as simple as in any area where you should be exercising leadership and authority. We are living in a day and age where leadership and authority is not celebrated. From the home to the classroom to the workplace, it's not celebrated. Are you using your agency to step into positions of leadership to do what is right? Let's start in the home. When I insist on following the rules and putting boundaries on my children, I am going to be less liked by them. 
But we're talking about living a life of love, radical love. What is loving to, to, to make sure that they like me? Is that loving? Or is it doing what is right for their sake, for their good, living a life of radical love, not afraid of the consequences? Keep doing good. And you can play that out into your school environment, your work environment, speaking up when something is going wrong, speaking up when you see wrong behavior happening. At school, the, the culture is snitches get stitches. That's not right. Sometimes we need to speak up. Sometimes we need to say, this is not okay, what's happening? Are we making decisions according to what is right or according to what will allow me to fit in? As a pastor, I, I'm a pastor in this community, but I'm also just a girl and I want to fit in with, with other ladies. I want to be friends with them. And if I'm in a conversation and they're all talking about something or watching something or whatever it is, listening to something and it's wrong, am I just going to keep quiet? Or am I going to say that's not right? We, if you are doing good and making decisions according to what is right, you will sometimes be persecuted. Love is going to require of us to do things that sometimes look like the consequence is not what we would like it to be. The statement is this, if we follow love far enough, we will be misunderstood made fun of, falsely accused, and mistreated. Love might cost you your life, as it cost Jesus his life. Which brings us to our third action point. Live without fear. We've spoken about breaking the cycle, do it, keep doing good, and now to live without fear. This Jesus that I'm supposed to now reiterate to you, what he's teaching here in, with his disciples, he's got a strange way of trying to get people to follow him. It is not the normal way of getting followers. Jesus' way is to say, listen, I'm going to be publicly executed, and you are, can only be a student of my way if you are ready to suffer and die with me. He invited his disciples to follow his example of denying himself, specifically using the words, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, pick up your cross, the instrument of your death, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? I'm reminded of when, when our, our first daughter was very little, we wanted to, sh we, she hated getting her feet wet. And so we got her a pair of gumboots. But she didn't understand the power of these gumboots. And so she would still walk around all the puddles, which sometimes if you're walking on a golf course or somewhere that has a lot of grass, it's a big puddle and she wants to walk all the way around it. And we, we couldn't get her to understand that you, you now have the power to walk through this without getting your feet wet. And so I had to demonstrate, I had to get myself a pair of gumboots and walk through and splash like this and then come through back to her, take my gumboot off and let her feel my sock. So I'm still dry. This is now possible. She was then delighted and would then walk through. She now understood that these gumboots gave her the power to walk through a puddle without getting her feet wet. Jesus' disciples needed to understand what would happen on the other side of death. To start off with, they were not, not, not afraid. When Jesus was first crucified, the disciples scattered and hid. You couldn't find them. There were no disciples anymore. They were all over the show, hiding for a few days. Didn't, they were like, wow, that was a waste of three years. What just happened? <laughs> we lost our leader and he hasn't come close to taking over this kingdom yet. Then Jesus appeared to them and historians cite their change of behavior as one of the most convincing proofs that Jesus actually was risen from the dead because they went from hiding and scattered to walking out bold, giving their lives, telling people about Jesus, preaching about him, bold as anything. How did they lose their fear? Somebody, Jesus, walked through the puddle of death, came back to them and showed them, my life is still intact. I'm okay. <laughs> Come this way. 
there. They were delighted to learn that they also owned a pair of gumboots, put them on, and went running through death. Most of them died radical deaths, understanding that they had life on the other side of it. They learned how to live without fear. The question for this action point is this, how would you live if you weren't afraid to die? What if you had no fear? What would that look like? Death is inevitable, but it is not final. There is life on the other side of of death. How can we practice this? How can we learn to... uh, how can, we, how can we practice laying our lives down? Well, Jesus said, self-denial. Follow me, deny yourself. This starts with when Richard rolls over in the morning, when the winter's night and takes the blanket with him. What does denying myself looks like, look like? It doesn't have to start with me running before a firing squad. It starts with little actions of denying myself until I learn that it's okay. There is life on the other, there is joy on the other side of me not being the center of everything. It is interesting to me that psychologists, spiritual men and women of all different faiths all seem to agree that the path of spiritual maturity goes from when we're young, we construct this ego identity. We, have, we self-create ourselves and how we want to present ourselves to the world. And that a journey of spiritual maturity looks like having the courage to dismantle that. Having the courage to realize that this is a false self. This is a self-created, a constructed ego identity. And laying that down and coming through to the other side. That self-preservation that we naturally have to try and protect ourselves seems to be cutting us off from the very source of life. And all of them whether they follow Jesus or not, seem to agree that we only really begin to live when we are willing to die to our false selves. People have followed the Beatitudes and and come a long way with with the curriculum alone, come a long way to understanding that if they can be pure in heart, if they can be their authentic selves, if they can stop trying so hard but can release that that self-preservation, that they can find a life of peace and even a life of love. But with Jesus, we have confidence in that love in this way. From, oh, I don't have the scripture reference of the next scripture. Will you put it up for me? 1 John 4, thank you. In 1 John 4, we read this about, so you'll see the, the is there a line bolded there that says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It starts with this though, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that's when God abides in him and he in God. And we've come to know and believe the love God has for us. God is love. When we abide in love, we abide in God and God abides in us. It's by this, by the fact that we've confessed in Jesus and that the love of God lives in us and us in him, it's that source of love flowing into our lives that enables us to be perfected. And we go on to that emboldened phrase, there is no fear in love. We have confidence in judgment day. There's no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. This this curriculum is life-giving, but when you do it, with the teacher who has access to true life, that is when you are able to lose all fear and stand in confidence for your eternal salvation. We are able to stand in the confidence that Jesus, there's not just a general love and letting go of ourselves, which will, which will help, but there is actually an input of the love of God that perfects us, enables us to clean out this toxic cycle and enables us to forgive others and let love flow through us in this world. We need to break the cycle. We need to keep doing good. And we can only live without fear in reality when we have a sure hope in what Jesus has done and enabled for us to live in this world. There is no fear when we have confessed Jesus as God. 
We don't have to protect ourselves. We don't have to protect our lives because he is the only one, so to speak, who can give us the gumboots that can walk through and actually come out the other side alive and able to live a life of love. As I started off, this is PhD level, living a fearless life of love. But in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, Paul writes, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is how it looks. If we are going to keep doing good, if we are going to keep choosing Jesus, if we are going to choose a life of of meekness and trust and dealing with how we're really feeling and being pure of heart and fighting for what is right and keeping on doing what is right and keeping on being merciful and being just, even when we are persecuted, we are going to be persecuted. It's... Like we say to young moms who have just fallen pregnant and are finding themselves feeling horribly nauseous, it's a good sign. It's a good indicator. It's an indicator that your pregnancy is healthy. When we are persecuted, we can rejoice because it is an indicator that we are standing up for what is good and we are living in a way that is different from what is celebrated in the structures of the world that we live in today. The rubbish of this world is going to be moved from one verge to another and from one life to another. But when we are, have access to the love of God and the confidence in his love, we are able to not resist evil with evil, but respond with good to evil. And in that way, clean out the societies and the communities in which we live. Will you stand with me?